Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note, I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. Of course, I'm just kidding. This video is going to cover one of my models and methods of impact, which is the Training and Development Systems View. So where did this training and development systems view come from? Well, back in the mid to late 80s, I began to work with some of my clients to redesign their training organizations. Uh, they had uh, experienced how I approached uh, instruction for their target audiences, which was to always start with the process. Uh, and I use performance models, a subject of an earlier video in this series. But we use the performance modeling approach to really pin down a process orientation uh, to the performance requirements of individuals so that we would understand with great clarity you know, what, uh, what tasks did they perform to produce what outputs and what were the stakeholder requirements for both outputs and the tasks that led to outputs. Uh, so, several of my clients had asked me to look at their organizations and, you know, it's more than just ADDI or instructional development or whatever label you want to give to your new product development process or framework. Um, but after defining their processes, we began to look at uh, uh, their internal processes as a, as a training and development organization. This was you know, back in the 80s before Senge's fifth discipline and everybody started moving from training to learning in very many uh, uh, cases in terms of how they relabeled, rebranded themselves. But uh, we looked at their processes and then we looked at, so who on your staff, job title by job title or person's name by person's name, were responsible for many of these processes. Well, I had a much more granular approach to looking at processes, and what we found is that many of the processes inside their organizations were simply not assigned to anybody. Nobody was responsible. Uh, they got done, they got attended to, but, but it wasn't formal. It was all informal and almost a knee-jerk reaction, and you know, that's no way to run a railroad, or a training and development or learning and development shop. But so just as I'd found in my decades worth of analysis efforts by that point, I started in 1979, uh, most processes are informal. They're not mapped, they're not formally managed, but they're informal. They're almost invisible, if not completely invisible, until they rear their ugly little heads and scream out that somebody needs to attend to them. and. Uh, do the work of the process, tasks leading to outputs. Hopefully they both meet the stakeholder requirements. Um, and it's often, often akin to, you know, the old saying of the cobbler's children don't have any shoes. Most training and development functions, in my experience, did a poor job of attending to their own process needs, their staff's development needs to participate, to perform in those processes. Um, and so, you know, what's, what's true for the goose is true for the gander, or however that saying goes, I don't know. Uh, so I use a performance orientation to help my clients better see their process performance situation, the problems and opportunities they're in. You know, it's not, we're not always problem driven, although mostly. Uh, sometimes we're opportunity driven. We have an opportunity to improve something uh, even better, you know, and I hope Hopefully that's after you've taken care of all of the really critical problems that you have and then you begin to work on uh, appreciative inquiry type approaches uh, so that you're not always feeling like you're in the repair business but perhaps in the design business, the improvement business uh, without it being rooted in a problem but simply as an opportunity. Um, you have to look at the risks and rewards in the situation and the job ahead at then uh, approving improving them to some state of adequacy. You know, we often don't have to make things perfect, not Six Sigma perfect, but just good enough. Um, and it depends on the risks and the rewards and the seriousness and likelihood of, you know, disaster befalling us and uh, running into trouble. Um, I, I do not believe in taking every process to a state of Six Sigma. Um, and, or conducting continuous improvements 
endlessly until the end of time on each and every one of the processes because at some point uh, you have diminishing returns and so the ROI begins to go from positive to nil to negative and you know that's not a good way to run a railroad or a training and development shop. Um, but uh, so we need to be somewhat conscious of ROI whether that's a formal calculation per the enterprise uh, approach and standards and algorithm or not. And while I don't believe in, in improving them you know, just because we have one to start improving them, I really believe in going after those things that have significant value back to the organization. But I do believe in naming and numbering them all as best as we can to make the informal more formal from a process standpoint, even if we don't intend to do anything about some of the newly named processes, the newly numbered processes. Um, uh, but again, to do that only when it makes business sense. Uh, so that's the functionality, uh, utility of taking a systems view and within that a process view of a training and development organization or function or nowadays a learning and development function or learning experience function or wherever we're going with the language because uh, like a uh, witness protection program, we're running uh, to new branding, rebranding to uh, run away from the sins of the past, I think. That's my joke anyway. Um, the way I look at systems, they are composed of processes or bundles of processes. And that's my own language. Not everybody agrees with that. But just so you know, that's when I talk about a systems view, I'm talking about being able to take a look at the processes and associated with each of those processes are the environmental assets that bring a process to life along with the human element that manipulates their environmental assets within a process to produce worthy outputs, to borrow the phrase of Tom Gilbert. Anyway, so let's now look at the uh, training and development systems view. Uh, so let's rock, rock around the clock as it were, as I've uh, uh, framed all of this with a clock face model. But at 12 o'clock, the Training and Development Governance and Advisory System. It's composed of two major processes. One of them is the governance process itself, where we've engaged in mostly a formal manner, but it doesn't always have to be informal. If you're a small organization, you can do this informally, meet with people at lunch, or attend some of their meetings. Um, and if you're a big huge enterprise and it's very complicated then you probably want to approach this in a more formal means. I've presented and written on this in the past and you can find those kinds of things on my website. But the governance process is the group that makes the business decisions as to where they're going to make investments in instruction. Uh, standalone job aids, job aids embedded in training or training when we really need people to memorize things and or hone certain skills. That's when we need training. Uh, otherwise, we might be able to get by with uh, job aids or performance support or whatever language is being used nowadays because a lot of those concepts uh, go back into the 60s. Uh, Rumler and Gilbert called it guidance back in the 60s at their uh, consulting firm Praxis. But another part of the governance and advisory system, besides the governance system, the group that makes the decisions, is an advisory system that takes their needs, the way I frame this, it's usually looking at process sets or functions, so the engineers might have an advisory council and the sales organization might have an advisory council, etc., 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 and they will take a look at their own internal performance requirements and the knowledge and skills within those things and then identify targets to address through formal instruction or social instruction or informal instruction where people are kind of figuring it out on their own by whatever they can find out there on YouTube. Um, but the advisory system is intended to uh, provide representation to those functional groups and to escalate, if you will, to the governance process and that board of decision makers who are going to make investment decisions, uh, they need to identify what's needed, what their requirements are, what the priorities are, what the costs to address them might be, and then float that up to the governance system to make the final business decisions. Now, I first ran into this when I was at Motorola in 19... 
81 and 82 and the person that I uh, when I left Motorola I joined the business of Ray Svensson the late Ray Svensson and Ray was working with Bill Wiggenhorn at MTech Motorola's training and education center to put in to do strategic planning for the new training function at Motorola and uh, central to that was the uh, creation of this governance and advisory system which engaged the top leaders of Motorola's five major business sectors and so the leaders of the business had yes and no control authority over where they wanted to see investments made in developing training that would impact their critical business issues the concept of critical business issues, I believe, comes from the late Gary Rumler. I got a chance to work with the late Gary Rumler back then at Motorola in 81 and 82. And that was his phrase for, you know, the, the high-hanging fruit, if you will, as opposed to the low-hanging fruit. But what were the critical business issues that keep the executives up at night? And are we attending to them? Are we aligned? You know, alignment is important, but alignment to what? Well, it should be alignment to the business. Well, to the businesses what? Well, to their critical business issues and to support those, uh, addressing those critical business issues regardless of what they are. Going into new businesses, new geographies, uh, advancing new products or services, uh, dealing with current state problems within the existing set of processes, etc. Anyway, so that's 12 o'clock. <clears throat> and I put that deliberately at 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock high was the name of a, a book and a movie about the Air Force and uh, you always got to keep your eye out at 12 o'clock you know looking into the Sun to see if you're going to be attacked from you know <laughs> behind the cover of the bright sunlight so 12 o'clock so I put that at the top because that's the most critical thing regardless of what we do we should be doing the business of our business leaders and helping them uh, facilitate the, the business in terms of current state operations and whatever near-term future state and getting ready for the long-term future state as best as they can see and predict all of that which of course is tricky and problematic because it's hard to do if not impossible but nonetheless they must do it so the next uh, one o'clock is the training and development strategic planning system and this is comprised of two components the enterprise strategic plan surveillance process so what one needs to do is, first of all, before you start developing your own strategic plan, is to go out and look at the customers that you serve and figure out, well, what are their strategic plans? Where are they going? Because that's how I'm going to get aligned. I'm going to get aligned strategically and make sure that I am supporting their strategic initiatives. Training and development or learning development, that's not the reason major corporations exist. Training organizations exist to support the core mission of their enterprise. Uh, they are the tail and not the dog that does the wagging. So when the enterprise needs something, the training organization needs to be responsive to that. So one of the things we need to do is, well, where are you going? So that we can make our strategic plans, which is part two of this, the training and development strategic planning process, but that's got to be informed by where is the rest of the organization going? Where are they going strategically? Then at 2 o'clock, training and development, operations planning and management. This is where we have our annual operations planning and budgeting process. Once we understand our strategies and where we're trying to go in some mid to long term, you know, that varies by enterprise in terms of what kind of volatility they currently exist in or see coming down the pike. Um, you've got a plan for that. So year by year, in one year increments or two year increments, we might be doing budgeting and planning. Where are we going to invest? What are our budget requirements from the enterprise in order to meet our current operational plans that are in alignment with the strategic plans that are being driven by the top of the organization? <clears throat> it's fairly logical, I think. And then there may be a quarterly operations planning and budgeting update process because, you know, in the volatile world here, whatever you planned at the beginning of the year may not still be appropriate mid-year. So you might take a quarter by quarter or a month by month. You're not going to be doing changing your budgeting and operational planning, you know, week by week. But, you know, so it all depends. So there's going to be times when you're going to do this in a routine manner and there's times when you're going to be doing this in reaction to a current state situation. Um, 
And the third part of two o'clock is the forecasting and accounting process. So we have to forecast, you know, if we get a million dollars for the year, are we gonna spend a quarter of a million dollars every quarter? Or are we gonna spend three quarters of that in the first quarter and then it's gonna be less so for the remaining three quarters of the year? We need to forecast our spend and then track accordingly to see if we're going to go out of whack. But if we hadn't told everybody that we're going to spend three quarters of our money in the first quarter and they see those numbers, they're going to be racked negatively here thinking that we're going to far exceed our budgets when actually that was the plan. So forecasting and then tracking against the forecast allows us to uh, have a better handle on that, communicate that better to the other organizations, especially the finance organization, which should be looking over everybody's shoulder to figure out, you know, uh, are we spending appropriately? Are we overspending? Are we underspending? Where are we in case we need to recover money and reduce our expenses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then comes three o'clock, training and development cost benefits measurement system. So just because we put in an operational planning and a forecasting and accounting process, we need to have a place to look at. So are we getting the returns, the benefits, dollarizable or not, uh, from our investments, from the costs that we're incurring? And so there's four components to this, the way I look at it, four processes, if you will, complicated processes, sometimes they're more simple, but a cost benefits measurement system design and deployment process. So we have to design this measurement process uh, to tell us about our uh, investments and our returns from those investments so we can decide whether or not that's adequate or whether we need to take those investment dollars, stop that investment, and go invest it elsewhere for greater returns to protect and improve the enterprise. Um, the next uh, process within that bundle is the ongoing cost benefit measurement and feedback receiving process. So once we create the process and attend to changes that might need to happen, uh, we're looking at it and using the feedback that we're getting from that to inform other parts of our own organization. There's a third part, training and development project lessons learn process. So are we learning from our experiences in implementing uh, and running our business and understanding our costs and the returns that we get, the benefits that we get from all of this. And so are we capturing those lessons learned to share them with others, uh, with uh, people operating elsewhere in the business today or for the next generation of people that are gonna come in? Or are we you know, expecting them to have to relearn what was learned just years earlier or even decades earlier? Where are we capturing the lessons learned? And the fourth part of this is results reporting and archiving process. So we need to archive this so we can search on that, we can learn from that, we can share it uh, as part of the company culture. At four o'clock, we've got the training and development process improvement system. So if the measurement system tells us we've got issues, perhaps we need to attend to those in a priority order based on the risks and rewards of the costs or investments that we're incurring and the benefits or the returns that we're getting back. So there's an issue generation and assessment process, an improvement planning, uh, improvement project planning and management process that needs to be undertaken. So these are things that leadership would attend to um, as part of this model, this uh, uh, the, the clock face model. These are the essence of leadership in a training and development function. Again, if, you, if you're uncomfortable with the training and development language, just convert that to learning and development or whatever is new by the time you've come around to watch this video. Uh, five o'clock then is when we begin to shift into the core business that we're in. And that's our, we, we need to attend to our training and development product and service line design system. So this is where we at a macro level design our products and services. Now, sometimes we offer training or instructional or learning products, but sometimes we offer coaching services. And so it's not a product per se, but it's an effort to serve the needs of the business. And whatever you want to call that, you know, we should be identifying, you know, how are we going to do that? Are we just going to let pick a few people and let them go out and coach people and, and train other people to be coaches and it's all out of control? Or do we want some semblance, do we need some semblance of control to ensure ourselves of the quality, the results from our efforts and investments. 
and it's a business decision to attend to those kinds of things. But the product and service line design system has three process sets in it. Uh, product and service line program management process. So if we've got you know a lot of this going on, we may need to have a program management process where we're managing our projects in programs or portfolios or whatever language your enterprise uses. You know, don't don't create new labels for things. Figure out what you call these things locally inside your organization and adapt guys language and labels to what's going to speak to your business. <clears throat> the second part of this is the product line design process for training, instruction, learning. Now, Guy's methodology for this is curriculum architecture design, where I am looking at uh, major target audience by major target audience or major process set by major process set and figuring out what are the performance requirements, what are the knowledge and skills required, what instructional content do we already have, whether that's job aids and or training or learning or education or whatever you want to call those things. Um, but are we designing that? Do we have that as a system? Or, you know, because otherwise we're going to be doing a bunch of one-offs that when you add them all up later on, you're going to find major overlaps and major gaps in that collection of content. And we want more than a collection of content. We want a unified system approach to instruction. ISD, Instructional Systems Design. So this is where that kind of comes in. People use ISD and ID very differently in our business, and so, uh, but this is how I use it. ISDers are doing uh, learning engineering, curriculum architecture design kinds of things. Again, we have many different sets of language and labels for things that are pretty much the same. The third part of this is looking at our service line. So if we're going to be offering coaching, for other coaches, coaching to executives, coaching to middle management, coaching uh, to provide that social aspect of learning. You know, uh, how are we doing that? Are we letting anybody be a coach self-declared or are we going to choose and pick some of the more critical areas where we want coaching to occurring and certify those coaches as being capable? Again, these are business decisions that must be made. So this training and development systems view framework is to help the business and the leadership of the training and development function itself get aligned and get business oriented here. Six o'clock is the product and service line development and acquisition system. So once we've architected something in, at five o'clock, at six o'clock, we have to go out and buy it or build it. And so there's five process sets within this in my model and the first one is the product and service line development and acquisition program management process if you're a large enterprise a large corporation a large government entity and you've got lots of instructional content being attended to being developed or redeveloped um, you're gonna have to have some way to manage all of that otherwise things can too easily get out of control and you can spend a lot of money for little return and that's something to be avoided. So number two is the custom development process. Number three is the purchase product acquisition process followed closely, most of the time I would hope, by the purchase product modification process. Now sometimes you're inhibited from changing some vendor's program. You've bought it, you can't monkey around with it and change it at all, but you can bookend it. You can bookend it on the front end and say, okay, this course that you're about to take guy it uses certain language that we don't use, so here's the translation guide, uh, but don't worry about the translations until afterwards. And then on the back end, you might say, okay, let's, let's uh, have some application exercises to apply what you've learned in this generic content that we've bought that we were unable to change um, and to make it authentic authentic to our real world and not some general construct that the vendor used in order to generate that content in the first place. You know, good for everybody, you know, one size fits all, which we should all appreciate that that actually is a false notion most of the time. Uh, and then there's our existing training development maintenance process. So if you're willing to invest in building it or buying it and putting it in place and using it, have you even begun to recognize what the life cycle costs for maintenance are? I mean, some content is good since, you know, active listening is good since the days of Socrates. But there's other content that's much more volatile. And when we decided to put that in place, did we recognize beyond the first costs 
what the life cycle costs would be. And is that reflected in our operational planning? Because part of our operational planning way back there at two o'clock was um, understanding um, there's maintenance issues that we're going to have year by year and some of that is predictable. It's not always predictable but you know if you said well it's not always predictable so we shouldn't even bother predicting it then you'll be clueless and surprised each and every time everything comes up and that's not an appropriate way to run the business. You should be able to look at your current state curricula and decide you know what is the maintenance schedule if any for some of this content and what is it likely to cost and of course you're estimating but the world of business is well used to estimating future costs for things they want a reasonable estimate that is not too far off when all is said and done and the dust is settled on the actual maintenance they don't want it to every maintenance effort to cost 10 times more than the estimate was because now you're going to blow your budget and you're going to run out of money or you're going to forego maintenance of content. And if that content was worthy and necessary to put in place in the first place, shouldn't it be worthy and necessary to maintain it over its life cycle? And it's not that every set of content is good till, you know, from the dawn of time or to whenever we put it in place to the end of time. No. Um, but, you know, there are certain things we're going to put in place and we're going to have to maintain that over its life cycle and we can be somewhat predictive about that and of course then we roll with the changes because change is inevitable and we need to have processes put in place that allow us to reflect those changes as soon as we possibly can. At seven o'clock then we're into the product and service line deployment system so we can architect or engineer instruction and then we can actually build and or buy it and then we've got to deploy it or make it accessible and that's what seven o'clock does. So there's, uh, there's seven processes within this system, this subsystem and the first one is the master materials storage and retrieval process. So rather than having all of your master materials on everybody's uh, uh, laptops or desktops, uh, we want to have some sort of central repository where we're storing all of this stuff in case guys' uh, laptop gets stolen and now it's all gone forever and we have to redo it. No. So we need some way to have a central repository you know, in the cloud uh, or on the company intranet, not in the cloud, or in the company's intranet on the cloud, in the cloud, system wherever we we need to store these things here because we're we're investing shareholder equity in all of this and we shouldn't be so loosey-goosey about this and uh, make it subject to being lost uh, inadvertently but lost nonetheless the second process is the master materials change management process so when we do the maintenance on the courses in six o'clock in seven o'clock we need to make sure that we're archiving the old versions and keeping at center you know accessible the newer versions but we may want to lock down the older versions so they somehow don't inadvertently get tapped into and reused because that's the old version for a reason for a purpose but in case we do need to go get it we may need to go into a court situation and prove that we've been training you know the version you know three years back your honor and jury said this and so if guy's messed up here it's on him it's not on the corporation we did our due diligence we trained guy so there's it's a there's a necessary reason we don't always like to acknowledge that there are legal reasons for why we do things in the training and development world but so we need to have that kind of a uh, archive if you will and we need to have a, a place a way to manage the change also in seven o'clock we need a scheduling process for that content those deliveries, uh, deployments that are scheduled, face-to-face -face training, webinars, etc. Um, it's more critical when you have a limited number of seats, so to speak. Um, in a webinar, you might have a limited number of seats or you can have, you know, 4,000 people join it or 10,000 or three, you know, it doesn't ma maybe matter. Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It all depends on the instructional design of that webinar. If there's group activities, uh, exercises that people are uh, doing to apply what they've learned and the facilitator instructor is supposed to be taking a look at that and giving you feedback before you go on and try it again. You know, you, you can't have unlimited number of people in that situation unless you found other ways to accommodate 
large, large, large groups in participating in these kinds of things. The fourth process in 7 o'clock is the facilitator and coach development and certification process. It's not that we need to certify each and every coach, but there are some things that, again, for doing our due diligence, we need to make sure that there are people who are certified to be coaches because if they've coached Guy and Guy goes and screws up and somebody gets hurt and we get turned around and get sued, we've got to prove that we, you know, we're attending to things in a reasonable manner. Um, and uh, again, not that we need to certify each and every coach, but, th but there are critical things that we're trying to convey through coaching that perhaps we should certify, qualify, those coaches as being competent and capable of delivering what it is that we needed delivered. The next one is the self-paced T&D deployment process. So if we have videos that people can watch on demand or brochures and books, if you will, that they can read on demand, self-paced kinds of things, um, how are we attending to that? And what is our process here for uh, deploying that and then maintaining it. Um, and then the uh, coach mentored uh, T&D deployment process. So it's one thing to certify, train and certify your coaches, prepare them. It's just like, you know, train the trainer kinds of things. Um, and then how are we deploying that? And what are all the mechanisms in place so somebody can actually get some coached or mentored training and development or learning and development, whatever you want to call it. At eight o'clock, we've now, so those last three, uh, five, six, and seven o'clock were the core. That's the essence of the training and development function or learning and development function. At eight o'clock, we begin to shift into support functions. So because we've got this training thing, we need to do uh, training and development marketing and communications. And we need to communicate with our stakeholders. That's one process set. We have an individual training and development planning process where people can take a look at what our offerings are and plan accordingly. And then their supervisor or team can track to see whether a guy is, you know, meet getting the training and development that we had planned for him. Is he holding off? Is he doing that? Is he... You know, so we need a way to monitor and manage that because if we had signed Guy up, if we had planned for training for Guy because he needed critical knowledge and skills and for some reason he's not attending to that, we need a way to flag his supervision that he's not on track for completing his training plan. Uh, and if that training plan was truly performance-based and in alignment with what the needs of the business are, then we weren't kidding when we put a plan in place and we want Guy to actually act, actually adhere to the plan and get trained per the plan. And of course we need to go in and change the plans every once in a while because we need to roll with the punches, etc., etc., because the world is just chock full of change nowadays. The third part of 8 o'clock is the ordering and registration process. So how does somebody actually, you know, uh, order, uh, in the old days we used to order uh, VHS tapes and, uh, you know, so videos and all that stuff. But if, uh, if we want to register for a class that's coming up um, and perhaps after taking a whole bunch of self-paced uh, uh, asynchronous, maybe we need to go into some synchronous thing where we're going to actually apply what we've learned and get feedback from a coach and then do that over and over again until we've really mastered it if that's what the uh, performance situation calls for. Um, we need a way to deal with that. At nine o'clock, we've got the training and development financial asset management system. So we've got computers, we've got chairs, we've got projectors, we've got uh, facilities, we've got lots of stuff, uh, hard assets, and we need to have some way to account for those kinds of things. Now, most enterprises and organizations, they haven't keep an inventory of all their stuff, all the chairs, all the conference room tables, et cetera, et cetera. And training and development needs to be able to do that too. So uh, as, as organizations do training planning at the individual level, you need to be able to roll that up to the department level, figure out what the costs are and the timing of all of that is, roll that up to the uh, functional level, roll that up to the division level, roll that up to the strategic business unit level, roll that up to the enterprise level so you understand, you know, where are our finances going. So the plans and budgets roll up and then again, the physical property management process. So how are we managing our physical property? You know, we got lots of computers here and we don't want them walking out the door and creating what uh, retail businesses call shrink. 
shrink from damage or theft. Um, you know, we just need to understand that where is our, where have our investments gone for these uh, tangible physical assets. So our physical property management process is again part of nine o'clock. At 10 o'clock we shift into looking at what are the human and environmental asset management systems. So the first half of this, there are 11 processes here, but the first half approximately are dealing with the human assets that we have, uh, people. So we've got recruiting and selection and succession processes. So if we're bringing people into the organization, are we going to grow them? Are we going to take people from being a delivery person to a developer to a designer to an analyst to a project manager? That's Guy's approach to growing people. Um, and so well, what's our process for doing that and understanding what are the needs on the other end? You know, beginning with the end of the mind, how many project managers do I need? How many analysts do I need? How many do I have currently? How many of them are going to be going on to the next career progression? therefore causing a vacancy and I'm going to pull from where outside inside you know and so without a plan uh, we're pretty much out of control and can't be predictable about how well that's going to go and what it's going to cost and when we're going to actually have it done from a schedule standpoint so this that process uh, is I think necessary and how formal it is again is it you know it doesn't need to be a six sigma uh, level kind of a process but we need to have some process in place to provide guidance to people or to provide them with tooling uh, 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 that enables them to do this kind of work the second process within this is the, our own training and development process for our own staff now the cobbler's children too often don't have shoes and training and development organizations too often, in my experience, going back to 1979, and all my clients that I've been working with as a consultant since 1982, the training and development of the training and development staff is something that seemed to never be adequately put in place. And, you know, it's, it's our business, but not our practice. Uh, to rephrase a joke that I learned from AT&T, they used to joke that uh, communications was their business, but uh, not their practice. So, but that's too often true of in the training and development world. We've not identified our own processes and the roles within those processes and our staffing and succession plans. And so therefore we're not training people to get them to be ready for when that promotion comes. And then we're always, after the fact, <clears throat> under the gun, trying to develop people in a hurry when we've already given them an assignment, put them in there, and now it's kind of sink or swim because the training and development they need might take longer than that first assignment that's going to confront them. So either we're getting ready before the need uh, for most of the time, or we're waiting until the need has hit us and then we're scrambling to make it happen and that often doesn't go as well as something that's more thoughtfully planned out and implemented. The fourth part of this is the compensation and benefits process for the training and development staff. You know, depending on where you are in the world, the, the reasonable uh, fully loaded salary and take home salary for an instructional designer varies. And so do we have that reflected in our operations planning and budget because we're going to have to grow the staff or shrink the staff or whatever. And so what are the cost implications uh, to the organization for doing such? There's a staff rewards and recognition process. So those are the processes, these first uh, five that deal with the human element, the human assets, the people, the human capital, lots of language for this, it's problematic. A lot of people don't like this. Uh, you know, why don't we just call them people? Yeah, we could. Um, and so what are our processes in here to deal with our staff so that we can fully populate our processes with people who have been adequately trained um, to do the job well enough? Um, or are they, you know, informally learning all this fumbling and stumbling around and we're blowing budgets and schedules and customer expectations and business opportunities and, you know, there's a whole raft of things that can go wrong um, if we in the training and development world aren't, aren't assisting the business in meeting its needs. Uh, then in this uh, same bucket here in 10 o'clock here, there's uh, uh, several uh, process sets, if you will, that attend to the uh, environmental assets. 
So what are our equipment and tool deployment and uh, development and deployment processes? So, you know, new technologies coming out, you know, how are we beginning to implement those new technologies? What's the plan? What are the cost implications of all of that? Uh, material and supplies acquisition. So, you know, do we need flip chart easels and paper anymore or have we gone beyond that and it's everything is digital and no, we don't need those and the pens and the tape to post things on the wall anymore? Or we still do because we've got a blended approach here with low tech and high tech. Um, as always, it depends. So the information systems and development and deployment processes. So what information do we need to feed into our own people and so that they can work on the processes with uh, good data, timely data, um, you know, uh, dynamic data that changes all the time. Are we refreshing that data set that guy gets to use in his job or is it last month's and it might be quite out of date the way the world works nowadays? That sometimes can happen. Uh, as we create new training and development methods, how are we deploying those across our staff and all the other stakeholders that might be involved? So those were the processes for 10 o'clock, which is a huge part of enabling our own processes here, putting the people in place, putting the, all the non-people things in place so that our processes can actually be populated and facilitated to do what they were intended to do. Lastly comes 11 o'clock, T&D Research and Development System. So there's three processes here. There's a methodology and technology surveillance process. Maybe that's going to conferences, reading all the journals, staying uh, uh, hip to what's going on online, so that we understand the new technology that's coming down the pike or has already arrived and what are the reactions and use cases from the early adapters and from the vendors. Are we surveilling that? Are we bird dogging that? Or are we uh, constantly being surprised by there's stuff that's already out here in our world and we don't seem to know much about it? So perhaps we need to have some of our resources attending to surveilling methodology and technology as it is evolving and uh, coming on uh, uh, available to us. There's an internal and external benchmarking process then, so we might be taking some of this new technology stuff and doing small scale tests of how that might fit and looking at what some of our uh, benchmarking partners, if you will, what are they doing with these kinds of things here and how, what, what did they find out? What can we learn from them so we don't make the mistakes that perhaps they made? Um, and how can we share with them, you know, our lessons learned and our experiences and some of the new methods and the new technology that uh, enables methodology. So we need to attend to that. And then there's when we've decided that, oh, we've done some benchmarking here. Let's uh, do some pilot testing and bring some of this in here and put it to test in authentic real world, in our real world applications and see how well that goes before we do any kind of widespread adoption and implementation of these kinds of things. Um, so as a, if you take a systems view, you're understanding the systems nature, the uh, uh, system, systemic nature of all of these things and they all interconnect. And that's one of the reasons why I used a clock face, because when I would outline this for clients and others, um, and I draw the big circle and talk about the various positions on the clock face, I could draw a line from, say, 12 o'clock down to the center and say, here's the demand from the business. They say, we've got this huge initiative. Let's put it center stage here in the middle of the clock face, you know, where the hands normally meet. And so if that's the thing that we need, where do the arrows from a clock go out to? What systems, subsystems, and processes will this impact? And so we can begin to look at the uh, interactive nature of the, uh, the systems nature of these various processes because many of them are tied together. And once you are doing something in one, it's going to have implications in the rest of them. And are we actually cognizant of that? as we start messing around in one of these processes, that this has implications for other processes? Do we even know what the current state mapping of these interrelationships are between these processes? Now, I've just talked about 12 subsystems of a training and development system, 
and within that were 47 processes. That's a lot of processes. And if you were to look a little bit more detail about these processes, these 47 processes, you, like most of my clients and people that I've shared this book with, uh, that I've written, um, would acknowledge that, yeah, we actually have all those processes, but as Guy might have said, and as Guy did say earlier in the video, most of them are informal. And, uh, you know, we attend to that process when it's reared its little ugly head and, and demanded that we do something. And then we've done that, but, it, you know, and maybe we're making it up differently each time we do it because it's informal. And, and maybe that's appropriate. Maybe that's okay that you do it differently each time. Maybe it's no big deal. But there's other of these processes that shouldn't be left informal and should be formalized. But only if there's significant return on the investment for formalizing processes. Again, I don't believe in doing formal process, getting them to some sort of a Six Sigma level or less. Um, or doing continuous improvement on everything because, you know, we've got nothing better to do. Usually we don't. Usually we have limited resources and we've got to be judicious in where we apply them. So anyway, in 2001, I wrote a book to address this, the Training and Development Systems View book, and I used my uh, LCS framework to organize my thoughts and to describe all these processes. And LCS stands for Leadership, Core, and Support. It was the subject of an earlier video in this series. The Training and Development Systems View book is available as a free PDF. You can find that on my website under the resource tab. And it's also available as a Kindle or paperback. In 2011, I updated that book along with several others to create a six pack. I joked that when I told Bob Maker that I've got a six pack too, he said, good luck with that. Um, but I, the, that book within the six pack is the Curriculum Manager's Handbook and that addresses these 12 subsystems and the 47 processes. So that's a little bit more updated than the 2001 version of this model or framework. Um, and again, that, uh, that Cricket Manager's Handbook, uh, Kindle or paperback. Um, and if you're not sure you want to get that, go and get the free version of the Training and Development Systems View book from 2001 and see if that meets your needs. That book has an assessment in chapter five, and then one later on at the end of the book, I think it's chapter 28, but I may be wrong now, um, that goes more extensive. But there's a quick and dirty assessment here so that if you didn't want to read that whole book, you could focus in on the chapters that related to things that were of issue, of importance, of interest to you. You don't have to boil the ocean to get a cup of tea. You can target your investments and time and energy in reviewing portions of this book and looking at these processes based on the needs that you currently have. At least that was my intent when I wrote the book and structured it that way. So that brings to a close another of our videos in this series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. And of course, I've subtitled this entire series, The Insomnia Solution but not for my insomnia, but perhaps for yours. And I'm just kidding. Good luck and cheers.